J. Warner Wallace was an angry atheist. I mean, there are a lot of angry atheists these days. And he was an angry atheist for much of his life. He's also been called America's foremost cold case detective. His cases have been featured on television programs, but he wrote a book recently in 2021 called Jesus, a person of interest. A person of interest. Isn't that terminology that is usually reserved for a crime and people that are involved in a crime? Why is Jesus a person of interest? Well, Jesus is the most interesting person that's ever lived. He had an amazing birth. He had an incredible ministry. He had a gruesome execution, an unfair trial leading up to that gruesome execution. And he conquered death. <laughs> there's, there's nobody that has had a more interesting life than Jesus Christ. He's also the most controversial person that has ever lived because he said that he was the son of God. And he said he was the only way to God. So absolutely, he is in some ways a person of interest for anybody on this earth. Now in these next few weeks, what I wanna do is I, as we're leading up to Easter, I want us to focus on the very thing that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were focused on in their gospels. One third of all the material in Matthew, Mark, and Luke are devoted to that last week of Jesus's life. In the Gospel of John, he devoted half of his Gospel to that last week of Jesus's life called the Passion Week. Now the disciples, I think you could say that they were persons of interest too. There's Matthew, the tax collector. Tax collectors were hated because they had basically sold out their own people and were working with the enemy, the Roman government. And then there was Simon the Zealot. Zealots, okay, they, they were a, a violent bunch. So there was Simon the, Bella, the uh, Zealot, and then Judas may also have been a Zealot as well. The Zealots were zealous for Israel, and they were zealous for God. They resisted the occupying forces of the Roman Empire. Rome saw them as terrorists. Josephus, a Jewish historian, described zealous as men who carried daggers. You know, really, there's only one thing a dagger is good for, and that is stabbing. And what the zealots would do is they would walk up in a crowded place, they would walk up to an enemy, and they would stab them. At least half of the disciples were professional fishermen, rugged men. They knew the meaning of hard work, they were accustomed to working from dark to dark. And three of those fishermen disciples were known to be hot-headed and violent. Peter was impulsive. Thomas was overly cautious. And Jesus took this bunch of guys and built a unity around his message, his good news, and he extended his ministry through them. This is what it says in Mark 14, verses 12 through 15. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. All right, you might be thinking, okay, now this sounds kind of mundane. Why are we looking at this? Well, even in these mundane tasks, I want you to see that Jesus is building a team. Jesus is doing something that is important for us to do today and that is to work together. That's number one in the outline, work together. Work has always been important to God. God created Adam and Eve and he gave them work to do in the Garden of Eden. Jesus made this statement in John 5, 17. My father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. So God didn't just create the world in six days and then rest and then keep on resting for eternity, he continued to work. 
We oftentimes see Jesus assigning his disciples some work. He sent two of his disciples ahead of him to get a colt and make preparations for him at the triumphal entry. He sent them out two by two to do ministry, preaching and teaching, healing, that kind of thing. He sent some of them to, to the city to prepare food and also to feed the multitude, thousands of people. And, and here he sends Peter and John into town to make preparations for the Passover meal. Okay, now what was, uh, what was that all about? What was involved in doing that? Well, they would go to the temple. They would pick out a lamb. They would take it to the priest to get it approved. The lamb would be killed in the temple court, offered at the altar. The blood was poured out beside the altar. Parts of the lamb were reserved for the sacrifice. The rest would be wrapped up in the skin and the disciples would take that and they would cook it. How they would do that is they would build a fire, they would roast the lamb on a spit, and they had a deadline. They couldn't take their time on this. Everything had to be done for the meal before the blast of the trumpet, which would signify that it was Passover, that it was the Sabbath, and no work could be done after those trumpet blasts sounded. All preparations had to be made because there was no work to be done on the Sabbath. Jesus knew the value of people working together. And when we unite in a building project or have to help somebody move or to work in the food pantry, take care of babies in the nursery, we have the satisfaction of doing those things that are building the kingdom and also creating a bond of unity. Second, we eat together. We bond with other people when we sit down with them and have a meal together. Now, what if the Last Supper was held in our times today? Do you think Jesus would have rented a bus and taken his disciples through the drive through to get Big Macs? I doubt it. That was not his style. Look at Mark 14, 18. While they were reclining at the table, eating. Reclining at the table, eating. Nobody in those days sat at a table except for maybe the king. People reclined on a low couch around the outside of a low horseshoe shaped table. They leaned on their left elbow, they ate with their right hand. Friends ate together. You know, enemies, enemies don't eat together. And we all know that the breakup of the family is a very serious problem in our culture today. Some say it's partly because people don't eat together. In fact, in a survey, 80% of troubled families said that they seldom ate together as a family. Have you ever noticed at a funeral, usually people are solemn, but after the service, there's a meal and people start smiling and laughing. Granted, there are still some tears, no doubt, but they start sharing memories and enjoy each other's company. I heard a comedian say, one time that he thinks it's weird that an hour after you're put in the ground that your family and friends are sitting in the church basement eating potato salad. That's why comedians <laughs> comedians don't do grief counseling. The dinner is a, a helpful part of the grieving process. The Last Supper was a funeral dinner in advance. And Jesus used that time to build unity in his disciples. Maybe we should think more seriously about planning some cookouts and things to do and eat with other people. And then third, grieve together. They were eating their meal and Jesus said to them in verse 18 and 19, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened. And one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. So they can't believe it. They've been together for three years now. They're best friends. And they can't believe that anybody would betray their master. When we go through hard times, we draw strength from each other. And we don't forget the times that we spend with people when when we're going through hard times together. Think about the times when you've been involved in some kind of a tragedy. Think about the people that were around you at that time. When your kid was sick in the hospital and you didn't know if they were gonna live. That time when the roof caved in, when the tree fell on it, 
when you lost your job, when you were at the end of your rope, and you didn't know if you could go on, the people that were with you then, that builds a bond. And that's why God wants us to go through life together so that there are other people around us that we're close to who can carry help, at least help to carry our burden. So make sure you're building friendships with other people at all times so that there will be somebody there when you go through the rough times. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. That's a very practical passage. Pity the man who has no one to help him up. Jesus talked to his disciples about the cross at that Last Supper. He prayed with them. He taught them. He told them about how they would desert him and how they would deny him. Now, why did he share that kind of painful news at this Last Supper? Why did he do that? He's preparing them to go through the grief and the problems that would come after his crucifixion. And then four, commune together. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper at that Last Supper. Mark 14, 22 through 24. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now, when Jesus said that, you remember the disciples that went to the temple and got the lamb, took it to the altar, the blood was poured out. And Jesus said, my blood is poured out. Do you think, see this is just earlier that day, do you think that those words hit a note with them? Jesus' blood is poured out at Passover in Jerusalem Roughly, approximately 250,000 lambs were sacrificed. Their blood poured out by the altar. We can't even imagine how gory that must have looked, must have looked like. The blood literally flowed from the altar out of the temple down into the valley, the Kidron Valley, where the brook of Kidron was there. And that brook would be tinged pink with the blood of all those sacrifices. And later on in that day, in, in that evening, the disciples and Jesus would cross over that brook in order to get to the Garden of Gethsemane because it's out the temple and down the hill and up the other hill. And that's, that's where Jesus was arrested. When Jesus said, this is my blood, I wonder if the disciples were thinking about all those sacrifices that had been done that day. Now the disciples didn't really understand, but those sacrifices would become obsolete because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice and no more sacrifices like all those lambs being slaughtered would be necessary. The Lord's Supper has been an intricate part of our lives as Christians ever since then. Jesus knew what we what were like. I mean, our memories are poor. We forget things. It's very easy to forget. We get distracted. But he instituted the Lord's Supper. Every week we gather for communion. It's a time of bonding with our Lord. It's not a time to be thinking about the weather. It's not a time to talk to your neighbor. It's a time to think about the Lord and what he has done. And sometimes people wonder why we here at Cornerstone take communion every single Sunday. Well, the main reason is because we're following the example of what it says in the Bible, partake on the first day of the week. As often as you meet, that's what we do. And in addition to that, this is just what the early church did. This was the pattern that the disciples carried on. It's been like that for 2,000 years. Every week, we need that moment of communion where we're reminded that God loves us, that we matter to God. Some people say, well, well, hold on a second. Doesn't communion lose its significance if you just do this over and over and over? Well, do you, do you lose the significance of somebody saying, I love you? 
with them saying it over and over and over? I mean, how many times can you hear the words, I love you? That's, that's powerful. We don't ever want to stop hearing those words. And then number five, sing together. Mark 14, 26. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Imagine 12 guys in a room singing. Yeah, I, I, I can't really imagine that. You know, sometimes men, I, I know from experience that men oftentimes are not all that excited about singing. That's too bad. Vince Lombardi, famous coach for the Green Bay Packers, used to have his football teams sing hymns before they would go out and crack heads. You know, I, I've never sung a song in church, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, and then wanted to knock somebody down, but it worked for them. He had them do that to get them united and get them all charged up to go out there and play football. Now, I'm personally not known for my singing ability. I have been asked to sing softly and tenderly on a hill far away. We sing praises to God because the Bible says that God wants to hear us sing praises. God wants it. And so we do it out of obedience to him and out of love for him. If, if there is any reason for a person to sing, it would be that they are saved by the grace of God and that is all of us. God wants us to go through life together and the people who have the most trouble in life are the people who don't have anybody, don't have anybody that they could call who would drop everything and come and help them. I mean, do you have even one good friend who would drop everything and come to your side to help you out in an emergency? Do you keep people at a distance or do you keep people close? If we work together and eat together and grieve together and commune together and sing together, just like in that upper room, we can build friendships with Jesus and with the Lord's people that will last for eternity. Jesus prayed, <clears throat> Jesus prayed that those 12 disciples would be united. But his prayer in that upper room was not just for them. He also prayed, this is how he said it, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. J. Warner Wallace, the guy I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, the author of that book, Person of Interest, said that his wife asked him to attend church services with her and with another couple that had invited them and who had promised that they would meet them in the parking lot and they would sit with them through the service. This is what he said. I wasn't raised in a Christian home and I didn't have any Christian friends in high school or in college. Most of the outspoken believers that I met at work were people I'd had occasion to arrest. He said, God didn't matter to me because I didn't think he existed. And the Bible didn't matter to me because I didn't think it reported anything true. But he loved his wife, so he went to church, and then he began to use his tools and experience as a cold case homicide investigator to look at the historic claims of Jesus. Not the Bible, he didn't use the Bible. He looked at the evidence the historic claims of Jesus. And in his investigation, he went from being an angry atheist to a skeptic, to a believer, to a pastor and author. Jesus will change your life if you let him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this passage of scripture that teaches us how to build friendships. Friendships with you and with your people. I pray, Lord, that you will help all of us in our churches to build these kind of relationships. Relationships that will last forever. And Lord God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.